Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, welcome to our first AES uh, UK section meeting of 2023. Um, our speaker will be our incoming chair, Mike Turner, and I'll talk a little bit about him later. Um, just as a, a little bit of uh, housekeeping to do, we're going to try and move instead of jumping meetings, which always is a bit difficult because some people get lost as they travel down the wormhole. We're going to try moving everybody at the end of the session from being at a webinar into being participants of a general Zoom session, which means all being well, you'll be able to ask your questions in person. Um, there's one tiny piece of housekeeping to do this. As when you're changed over, you need to keep an eye open. Zoom, stay in Zoom. Zoom will send you a message saying you're now being uh, made a participant or something like that. And it'll have an OK button. You need to press that OK button um, or you won't end up with our, in, in the uh, as a participant in the session. I'll reiterate that at the end of the talk as well so that um, uh, nobody gets left out. All being well, it'll be just like walking to the bar next door, unfortunately, without the bar. But we can always imagine. Um, right, so without further ado, let me introduce you to the speaker um, this evening. Um, I've known Mike for quite a while, um, and uh, he's got an interesting background. He spent uh, his early days having received a Bachelor's of Electronics degree in uh, Leeds. He actually spent the first couple of years of his professional career with BBC Radio in London and therefore um, went through the BBC training regime um, at Wood Norton, I believe. Um, and uh, having done that, he then left the BBC and went into industrial electronics. Um, and this might seem a very strange background, but we then spent years designing um, control systems for motors um, of a variety of types. Um, and then with his audio interest, he suddenly realized that after all, everything he was doing with motors was applicable to loudspeakers, which after all were a specialized form of motor. Uh, he then worked on his PhD part-time while keeping the job going. Um, and developed um, some new techniques for controlling loudspeakers and providing better bass performance. Um, uh, having done all that, Mike now operates his own consulting and technology licensing business. Um, and you can hear some of the results of that, literally hear some of the results of that um, at work, uh, his PhD and further development in some of CAF's award-winning active loudspeakers, including the KC62 subwoofer and the new LS63 way. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about power devices and audio. So please take it away, Mike. Okay. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, and hello, everyone. I will just jump to share my screen and hopefully if I go into presentation mode, you can all see that. Um, yes, power electronics in audio or and audio. Um, two subjects which might not seem to have much to do with one another, and indeed for many, many years they didn't. Um, harking back to my early days at the BBC, and Jamie's quite right, I trained at Wood Norton. Uh, one of the cohort at Wood Norton was a lad called Graham, whose surname escapes me. Um, but he worked, unlike me, uh, at Bush House, which was where the home of the World Service. I was at Broadcasting House most of the time. Um, and at BH, we didn't really have to do much other than audio stuff. But at, uh, at the World Service, their, their um, repertoire was a bit broader. Uh, and they came across things like monitors, computer monitors, computer power supplies. And I always remember Graham talking in, in hushed tones over his beer about what he called Dr. Death power supplies. And that was a, a switch mode power supply uh, in the days when you didn't see very many of them. And the Dr. Death thing was, of course, all about uh, the high voltages and the things that could go wrong with them. Um, 
things have changed a lot, of course, in the intervening decades, as they do. Um, and nowadays, um, we see power electronics all over the place um, in, in uh, just about every electronic device, in fact, that you go and buy today. Um, but before we get into the history of it um, too much, let's uh, just ask ourselves, what do we mean by power electronics? What's different about it? And the answer to that really is, of course, that it's to do with, as its name suggests, the electronic conversion of power or energy um, with the emphasis on that energy doing work. We're not talking about signals or information here where the, the actual energy level of the voltages and current um, are, are, unimport, are irrelevant, really, um, except for the fact that they're a nuisance that we have to provide them. Here we're talking about power electronics doing um, processing, changing voltages, changing current levels, efficiently all being well, uh, to do something useful, to power some other piece of equipment or to power a load, whatever that might be. Um, it's necessarily somewhat synonymous, as the slide says, with switch mode power conversion. And the reason for that is simply that um, if we use um, active devices, not as switches, then we have voltage and current across those devices at the same time. That means they ipso facto have power loss um, and we don't want power loss. Power loss is going to cost us heat. It's going to cost us these days a lot in the electricity meter at the supply. Um, and so we use switching technologies that allow us to either close a switch, in which case there's lots of current flow, but no uh, voltage drop, hence no power loss, or, or the switch is open and the reverse is true. We have voltage across the switch, no current flow, again, no power loss. Um, how do we use then these devices to control the flow of power? Um, well, the answer is we, we adopt, and what I've loosely called here, the time domain, and I don't mean that as opposed to the frequency domain, I really mean as, as opposed to the amplitude domain. And in linear, regulator, a linear power supply, we adjust the current flow progressively and smoothly until we get the output voltage we want. Um, in a switching regulator, the, the pass device is either on or off, and what we have to do is average out the onness and the offness, if you will. And uh, by doing so, we end up with the correct average output voltage with a little tiny bit of ripple on it. But we end up with hopefully the advantages of, of low losses. Um, and that low pass filtering is needed just to smooth out the switching artifacts. Um, it's often been called a black art, back to my friend Graham and his Dr. Death power supplies again. Um, it isn't really a black art. I, I would argue it's very far from that. It's a science like, like any other, um, an engineering discipline. But um, the things that you have to think about are a little bit different, a little bit more fundamental, perhaps, than we're used to in the signal processing world. Things like um, parasitic impedances in the circuit capacitances, stray inductance particularly is a bit of a nightmare. Um, all the components by definition are working hard because we, we pay a lot of money for them and we want to get plenty of power throughput. Um, they, as a consequence, will run warm, even though we'd prefer that they didn't. And um, there are, generally speaking, low impedances, low resistances particularly, which means that uh, it's very easy to get high current flow very quickly. So the upshot of all of that is if you're not careful, you end up with things like the pictures at the bottom. Those are real world images. Um, I was surprised I didn't have more photographs in my repository of things that have gone wrong. But I guess when things go bang, <laughs> we tend not to uh, uh, want to remind ourselves of it. But yes, it's an unforgiving thing. And that means that you can't just, for example, build up a switch mode power supply, switch it on and hope it'll all work the first time you ever power it up. That's a very unwise thing to do. Uh, and you have to work very methodically and very carefully. And that tends to lead to people thinking it's more of a black art than it perhaps really is. A um, bit of history first before we, we get into the technical side of things. The history of it's interesting. I think I, I find technology history interesting anyway. Hope you do too. Um, and I was thinking about what are what, what, what is the first instance of a switching uh, set of electronics? And I suppose really it goes back to um, you know, literally the Victorian era, the late 1800s and spark gap transmitters, where the the gap between the two electrodes, I don't know whether you can see my pointer, but um, is, is basically a switch. The, the air gets ionized between the two electrodes, drops a very low voltage, relatively speaking, 30 volts maybe, uh, when the arc is struck and withstands many thousands of volts when it's not. So it is a switch. Um, it was arranged with a coil and uh, made to self-oscillate. Uh, 
uh, and in doing so produced uh, copious amounts of, of radio frequency hash, I suppose, really, which later got tuned by um, uh, L's and C's on the on the output on a tank circuit. But uh, we'll come back to the the, the broadband hash uh, creation possibilities later on uh, when we look at some real world power electronics today. Um, if that's a little bit too primitive for you, um, probably the earliest real power electronics that we sort of recognize today uh, is this. Don't Google this at work. Um, the vibrator power supply. Um, these used mechanical sets of contacts um, in a, an arrangement rather like an electric doorbell or buzzer. You know, you've got a, a, a vibrating reed um, and that opened and closed contacts as it vibrated and it alternately put um, voltages on opposite halves of a center tap transformer usually. And in doing so, the transformer received effectively alternating current, which could then be stepped up and used fire rectifier usually to provide the high voltage DC supplies that uh, electronic equipment, which was all valve based in those days, tubes if you're from America, of course, um, they needed HT supplies, high tension supplies of 100 to 300, 400 volts and more. And that was how you got it in mobile equipment, like a car radio, for example, um, in the early part of the 20th century. Surprisingly well-developed technology, actually. There is, if you wish to Google such a thing, and it's very easy to go down rabbit holes, as I did for a number of evenings, sort of looking up the history of this. There is even a Mallory Vibrator Handbook, which goes into a lot of detail, and it is actually humblingly well thought through. Um, they've got a capacitor in the primary of the transformer that resonates with the inductances in the circuit. And that essentially, if it's tuned correctly to the same uh, frequency as the reed, uh, gives you effectively zero voltage switching. It eliminates the sparks on the contacts and gives you long life. So although they look primitive, these things were pretty well thought through and pretty well developed, and one has to take one's hat off to them. Um, the switching frequencies were necessarily low because of mechanical contacts. We're talking typically about 100, 120, 130 hertz. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the military uh, ever at the bleeding edge um, were very quick to spot that, of course, a higher frequency would allow the use of a smaller transformer for the same power throughput. And they had special versions that were made at four or five hundred hertz. Um, not very high by today's standards, but nevertheless enabling a worthwhile reduction in the transformer size. So a bit of interesting history. Um, another bit of history, um, this gentleman's name, of course, should be a legend to us all, uh, Alan Bloomline um, of EMI Laboratories. And um, hopefully many of you will have heard his son speak uh, a year or two ago in a very, very memorable AES lecture. Um, he, of course, synonymous with stereo and, and dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of patents in all sorts of electronic building bricks that we take for advantage, take advantage of and take for granted today. Um, Alan Bloomline was engaged after he'd worked on stereo at EMI uh, in television development. And they realized that when they were scanning an electron beam across the TV screen, they needed quite a lot of current in magnetic coils. Magnetic scanning was advantageous because it allowed smaller cathode ray tubes than electrostatic ones did. Um, but there was quite a lot of energy in the coils at the end of the scan. And they were concerned about the loss of that even in, in the 1930s. Um, it cost quite a lot in, in heat and in power supply. And Alan Bloomline came up with this arrangement of a switching output stage to drive the scanning coils in a TV receiver. Um, and there's a very nice pattern description of it, but there it is, a resonant converter in the early 1930s, using, of course, the, the vacuum tube, not in the linear region, but as a switch. Uh, this would be a triode, a pentode, typically, uh, and he also mentions uh, a thyrotron, which was a gas-filled electric tube. And that saw um, use in quite late on, actually, in TV history, because the war, the Second World War got in between. Um, Pi adopted it, seemed to be the first users of it in 1948, and they talk about a transformerless TV. And that's quite a big deal, because in the previous sets, they'd had um, a thumping great tran mains transformer, 50 or 60 hertz transformer, to provide all of the voltages, including the 10 or 15,000 volts that the final anode needed in the cathode ray tube. But uh, using Bloomline's ideas, 
um, Pi were able to eliminate um, the transformer because the rest of the voltages could be had straight from the incoming mains power supply at typically 240 volts. And just by rectifying that without a transformer, they could save a lot of cost in the TV set. Um, so that really set the mold for television uh, design for the next, I don't know, th 30 years or so, probably at least, uh, even beyond that, perhaps. Um, but nothing's ever new. Um, class D amplification was, of course, something that I wanted to talk about in, in a fair bit of depth tonight for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, you think that's new and you do a bit of searching again. Um, I found a, a reference to this in a fascinating Wireless World article by David Burt. And in fact, in 1930, 19 flipping 30, um, there is a patent from BTH, um, I think it was uh, General Electric in the States, um, who had this idea. And there it is, a, a switching amplifier, push-pull output stage based on valves, tubes again, um, with all of the basic uh, attributes. It's got a, a triangle wave generator, crude here, but nevertheless present. You can see the sawtooth there. The comparator action to turn that into pulse width modulation is essentially in the switching action of the output stage. Um, and lo and behold, you have a PWM amplifier patented in September 1930. Somewhat sobering. But uh, I guess because of the slow switching speeds, um, nobody really looked at it, certainly for audio purposes. And the sort of things you'd see in power electronics are this. I just love the photograph here. Um, this is based on those thyrotron type switches, mercury filled argon valves. Uh, and they were used in this sort of thing, not to really process or, or to chop up the AC waveform, except for voltage regulation. This was like a, a big lamp dimmer, basically. It's phase angle controlled. Um, and although the output voltage is thus electronically stabilized and it qualifies by our description of power electronics, um, it's still blooming heavy and big, as you can see. Um, and just to illustrate the kind of development, we've got a, one of those thyrotrons here with a ruler, um, a size and scale, and then a a modern uh, thyristor, silicon equivalent, um, with, of course, you know, much better performance and a tiny fraction of the cost. But I guess you'd you'd expect that. Um, so that was power electronics, really, in the in the pre fifties, pre sixties. Um, very niche usage for for uh, a limited range of applications, and the game changed, of course, when solid state switches became available. And the thyristor was the first one. Uh, latching device is so somewhat limited in, in the ways it could be used, but people did use these for not only phase angle control, uh, the, the sort of glorified lamp dimmer again, um, rectifying AC and stabilizing the output. Uh, they were also used in force commutated inverters. And by force commutation, I simply mean that once you turn the thing on, the circuitry had to make arrangements to kill the current through the device, otherwise it would stay on. And of course, bad things would happen like the photographs I showed you earlier uh, with burnt offerings. Um, the BJT, of course, was the first big enabler. Uh, we actually finally had a device that would, would not only work as an amplifier in the linear region, but could be used saturated, turned on and off. Problem with these was they weren't very robust, they didn't stand high temperatures, and they were pretty blooming slow. We're talking, you know, tens of microseconds to, to switch on and switch off. So not much good for class D amplification where we need hundreds of kilohertz switching frequencies, certainly tens. Um, but nevertheless, they were used in things like um, car battery inverters, popular wireless, practical wireless was full of circuits for uh, car based, car battery based uh, inverters that would turn uh, 12 volts into 240 based on a pair of these things. Um, gradually they improved, they, they got to the point where they could at least block decent voltages and they were used in television line scan circuits where um, because of that resonant capacitor that we saw earlier, they didn't really have a lot of turn off stresses and I'll come back to that later. Um, but the game changer again in the 60s with the silicon bipolar junction transistor, uh, a lot better, much more rugged, high temperature, robust, um, still not all that fast, but they improved gradually. Um, little ones were used in, in things like um, 
uh, industrial switch mode supplies. If you open up a, a Bruel and Kerr microphone preamp or um, accelerometer unit from the 70s, you'll see uh, all of the internal supplies are derived from four and a half volts by a quite a neat little switching regulator. And um, Calrec Audio, um, not far from me here in Yorkshire, uh, made microphones which had a, a power supply from a battery designed by Peter Baxandel, there's a famous audio name, uh, and those provided the polarizing voltage for the capsules that were needed, 48 volts from a handful of volts from a dry cell. Um, back to class D amplification, um, I, digging again, found this article um, in Wireless World, and if you're interested to look it up, February 1963, uh, there's a lovely archive, I think it's called... Um, World Radio History or something like that, and, and it's an archive in the States of all of these scanned in over many, many decades, many other journals as well. Um, and there's an article by a chap called David Burt, who was latterly at the BBC in transmissions, but in these days he worked for the Mollard Research Labs uh, near London, and um, he had this idea of, of using the GE patents as it was, uh, with solid state switching to produce a switching pulse, pulsing switch mode amplifier. Um, and there's the diagram for it. And uh, interestingly, he wasn't allowed by Mullard to actually put his affiliation in the article. Normally Wireless World, if you've read the journal, has uh, author affiliations and talks about um, you know, what they do and where they came from. And Mullard was sufficiently nervous about the uh, reliability of their transistors in this sort of application that he was asked not to put his affiliation on it. Um, no such shyness from Clive Sinclair, however, um, who I don't know as a, whether it was as a result of that article or not, but certainly the timing fits, uh, came up with these things, these um, transistor-based PWM amplifiers, uh, very simple circuit with a, a stable multivibrator, a integrator to produce the sawtooth waveform and a Schmidt trigger and an output stage. Um, not very robust by all counts, and he came out with another one very quickly, which was the X20, um, a bit more uh, sophisticated and perhaps more uh, tried and tested and a uh, different output stage. But nevertheless, these things worked. You notice this one has a choke on the output to remove the PWM from the, uh, well, at least attenuate it a bit, stop it burning out the tweeter in your speaker. Um, but they weren't massively successful. Class AB became king um, and the world moved on, mostly anyway. Um, but there were still lots of drivers for improvements in, in power electronics generally and a need for power electronics. Well, why? Um, firstly, of course, the power density issue we've already seen. 50 hertz transformers are huge, heavy. Linear regulators are inefficient. So are Class B amplifiers. People want more outputs to provide more complicated circuitry. Digital stuff was coming in. Um, and early in the game were people like um, the transmitter, AM transmitter people, because uh, the classical AM transmitter has an output stage comprising a, a class C amplifier, a pulsed uh, output valve tube again, uh, handling hundreds of kilowatts very often of radio frequencies, and they were amplitude modulated by connecting a variable voltage to the anode supply, and that variable voltage had to come from a thumping grate audio amplifier of, of similar sort of power level, two to one is the ratio, something like that, um, maybe wrong about that, but anyway, it was certainly a flipping big audio amplifier, and um, the Class B designs were expensive and inefficient, needed big transformers. And so people like Harrison Gates in the States were among the first. Redifon picked it up in the UK. So did Marconi at the start of the 80s, I think, quite late on. Um, and they used PWM amplification for their transmitter modulators. Um, I guess the problems there were a little bit easier for them because they didn't need vast amounts of bandwidth, although they were they needed you know, nine kilohertz maybe, but not a lot more than that. So it was it was not a, a high fidelity amplifier in that sense. Um, and the computer and telecoms people were always in need of high currents at low voltages, which were again difficult to deliver. Um, don't want to dwell too much on this because we'll talk more about switches later. Um, but as Technology in the semiconductor industry improved, so people adopted it. And the real game changer, I guess, was um, the arrival of the silicon power MOSFET. Uh, people like Hitachi and International Rectifier came out with these um, nice devices that could really switch down to quite low on resistances of a 
fraction of an ohm and could handle certainly tens and, and, and later hundreds of volts. Um, those were adapted in the 80s mainly by the power industry and by them, I mean, in, um, in motor control, that kind of thing, the IGBT, as it's known, which is basically a hybrid of, of, of a BJT and a MOSFET. It actually has a four layer structure, rather like a thyristor, actually. So it's a bit of a, uh, a mongrel device, very widely used today for, as I say, motor control, inverters, power, uh, power grid applications, um, you can wind turbines, that kind of thing. You can see these in, in inverters from kilowatts up to megawatts. And we'll talk a bit more about power diodes as well, because they were an almost equally important uh, enabler in all of this. Uh, and of course, there's the future to look at as well with what happens beyond silicon. Um, let's skip over that. These, these are some of the kinds of devices I've come across in my career, just to give you a range of flavor uh, flavor of the range of them and sizes to220s and surface mounts uh, all the way up to these things which are kind of the size of a small paperback book uh, and handle literally thousands of amps and thousands of volts you know, pretty diverse um and again the applications that go with those I won't dwell on that um how do we get to uh, more efficient, more compact power conversion? Well, we can use higher frequencies um, because smaller transformers um, will carry the same amount of throughput if the higher frequency is used um, because of the magnetic properties. Um, we can also store energy. We can use capacitors and inductors, if you like, as energy buckets, pick up energy from one place, put it in another, uh, store it as needed. And we can use... Um, reactants rather than resistance for impedance if we want to filter or if we want to um uh, for example um modulate an impedance we can use in inductance rather than resistance um, because the inductance is is in theory at least uh, lossless and the maths um i came back I mentioned at the start we're looking at sort of fundamental stuff a lot of the time here um, very simple maths uh, is very useful here. These, these relationships tend to get forgotten um, in electronics courses, even though they underpin so much behavior, because we're looking at a higher level of abstraction. People are thinking about uh, um, small signal circuits, but very fundamentally, uh, Faraday's law, Coulomb's law, current in a capacitor is multi capacitance multiplied by rate of change of voltage, uh, and so on. So keep those relationships in mind as we, as we move over to have a quick look at the fundamentals. Um, this can't be a power electronics tutorial as such, it's more to give you a flavour, there's too much to cover in, in such a short space of time, but I hope this leaves you with a little bit of insight at least into you know, what the issues are and why they exist. Um, I'll talk about this very basic, what we call a switching cell, which is essentially a, a switch and a diode uh, I happen to have shown the switch as a transistor just out of laziness. Um, and um, we will use uh, the assumption that somewhere is, is connected the other end of this inductor. Well, that could be to another similar switch and diode arrangement. It could be to a tap on the power supply, something like that. The important point is just bear with me and assume that there's some current flowing in here established by whatever means. If we close this switch, then we can um, move the voltage here down to zero, ideally. If we open the switch, then the current has to divert up to the diode. The diode turns on and the voltage at this midpoint jumps up to VCC. So by switching the switch on and off, we can swing the voltage here back and forth from naught to the full supply rail and back to naught. And then we can filter that or, or do other things to it and regulate the average current in the inductor by using pulse width modulation, for example. And we can do that in theory without any loss. Um, and just to say that if we add a second switch and diode pair, this S2D2, um, in the first image here, I've got current flowing from right to left in the conventional sense. There's no current path in the other direction. If we want alternating current, we simply add another switch and another diode. And now we have, uh, again, the ability to swing the voltage up and down all the way from zero to the rail. And we can carry current in either direction. And 
Um, this inductor might be, uh, for example, the output filter in a cluster amplifier, or it might be the output filter in a switch mode power supply. Um, things are very nice in that ideal world. What happens if we turn the switch on and off? Well, of course, if, it, if, the, if the switching happens instantaneously, there's no loss at all because the current is either zero or, or present. Um, and if the switch is on, there's no voltage. If the switch is off, um, there's no current. Uh, and no no loss at all under any of those circumstances. If, however, and let's assume just a slight imperfection, let's assume that the switching time of S here is finite, then for a short period of time, we've got voltage and current together. And interestingly, you'll notice, importantly, you'll notice that in order for this diode to carry the load current away from the switch, it has to be forward biased. And that means that the voltage here in the midpoint has to swing up above VCC by 0.7 of a volt or so. So no transfer of current is possible until the switch voltage reaches its uh, supply rail and a tiny little bit. Um, and that means that we inevitably end up with a, a spike of loss in the device. And these numbers can be pretty substantial. I remember in my early days as a power electronics engineer developing a motor control system and being horrified to realize that my oscilloscope graticule, which was looking at waveforms exactly like this, was calibrated at 512 kilowatts per division. It was a fairly sobering experience, even though we were only carrying you know, modest hundreds of volts and hundreds of amps. Um, the turn off uh, is, is like that. The turn on is um, very similar, almost identical. The only difference is that um, we don't have to uh, complete the switching interval before the current commutates. So we get somewhat in an ideal world, somewhat less of a spike of, of loss. Um, but the principle remains the same. And if, we, if we're doing this switching rapidly, we can calculate the peak value, we can calculate the area knowing the time period and integrating in that way, we can work out the energy in each of these little green triangular pulses. And then we multiply by frequency, we end up with the, the continuous average switching loss as it's called. Um, just a little bit of, of, of a cold draft of reality into this. Um, things aren't of course as nice as that in reality, we've got, uh, stray inductance everywhere. Um, and this is a, a particular nuisance in power electronics. We have, because we want this switching interval to be as short as possible, because the shorter it is, the less energy we waste. N necessarily, we have a very high rate of change of voltage and current. And the current here might swing from um, nothing to maybe 100 amps in, in let's say, um, 100 nanoseconds, maybe even less than that. So we've got tens of thousands of amps um, per microsecond of, of current change possible. Very, very, um, sorry, 1,000 amps per microsecond, but large, large rates of change of current. And those will cause voltage drops across these inductors, and you get spikes of voltage appearing across the switch when you turn on and off. Um, there's stray capacitance everywhere, particularly in, in MOSFETs in, uh, in the output of the device, which has to be discharged. If we turn the switch on, we can uh, effectively discharge it into the switch and that costs loss. Um, and the diodes themselves, if they're bipolar devices with a PN junction, they will have charge carriers in them, which have to be swept out before the diode will block. And uh, in that case, uh, we end up with a spike of current. We actually end up with a short circuit across this supply for a short period of time, limited in current by the stray inductance, and then everything clears, and then we get another overshoot of voltage. So there's quite a lot going on, even in this very simple circuit, which is why it's perhaps a bit different in flavor to signal level electronics. Even a simple circuit like this um, has hidden depths that, that we actually have to look at in detail and quantify. Um, and modeling it is, in, is, is difficult in consequence. The stray parasitic elements all matter. Um, and very often you'll find people like me still modeling little chunks of circuits rather than enormous great systems, although multi-physics modeling is coming increasingly into power electronics as well. Um, and this is the sort of thing you see in reality. Um, I won't again dwell on this too much because time is short, but if we turn the switch off, uh, we get an overshoot of voltage because of that stray inductance here. Um, 
we get if if it's a bipolar switch we can often get a bit of tail current and some loss associated with that as the charge inside the device all recombines we don't have access to dealing with that through the the gate terminal um, the voltages dip a bit here because of the stray inductance and so on and at turn on we see this spike of voltage uh, sorry spike of current uh, due to the charge in the diode being swept out as I mentioned earlier and again you get a little step quite surprisingly symmetrical um, sort of a duel of one another in some ways and these are real world waveforms just to show you that I'm not making it all up entirely uh, these are from a real power converter I worked on about a year ago uh, the turn off of a pretty chunky insulated gate bipolar transistor module here half bridge module um, and you can see the overshoot bit of ringing uh, caused by stray capacitance and inductance resonating the tail because of the bipolar device. Not much of a step there, which shows that the uh, LDI by DT is relatively small at that point. Turn on, you see the spike of, of current due to the diode unblocking very clearly, clearing out its stored charge. So it does happen in reality. All of this is called hard switching. We call it hard switching because at turn off, as I described earlier, the voltage across the switch has to go all the way to the positive supply before the diode can help by taking the current away and that gives you a locus if you plot current and voltage on a chart like this gives you a square locus essentially like this and a lot of power semiconductors particularly the silicon bjt's didn't like this they don't like it uh, you get secondary breakdown occurring current going where it shouldn't hogging being hogged by hot spots uh, and devices destroying themselves in the process. Um, so SOA, as it's called, particularly reverse bias SOA at the turn off, is a big deal in power electronics. And that's one of the reasons why we see MOSFETs uh, and IGBTs taking over uh, from um, things like bipolar transistors, particularly. Um, diodes, just a quick word about diodes. Um, we've already talked about how uh, the stored charge on the, in them is a nuisance. Um, it's also desirable not only that the small the charge is small but also when they do eventually recover blocking that they do so fairly gently again it's that v equals ldi by dt uh, equation derived from faraday's law if the current snaps off really fast you've got a big spike of reverse current through the diode that suddenly goes away you get voltage overshoot and electrical noise coming from that um, and diode recovery is actually a major source of noise in supplies that use PN junction diodes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's also a source of loss. Um, there are things you can do about it in the case of a power MOSFET, which has a body diode in it. Some people use the body diode um, because it, it's there for free. Um, the structure of a MOSFET has this um, actually quite symmetrical arrangement, but because the body is normally tied to the source, one of the diodes that's there is, is shorted out, you don't see it. The other diode becomes called the body diode, and they're not very nice diodes, they tend to be quite, um, uh, have, have quite a lot of stored charge in them, they, they tend to uh, have not very good forward characteristics either, and a lot of the development in the power MOSFET uh, world has been to improve the characteristics of those, and from my own experience I can say that even today it tends to be the limiting factor um, in the switching frequencies that you can use in some circuits. Um, you can get around it if you put a Schottky barrier diode around it that has a much lower forward drop than the body diode and therefore will take the current preferentially. But Schottky diodes tend to be limited to you know, a, a fairly low voltage, a couple of hundred volts maybe, unless it's a silicon carbide one, in which case you have to put a, a what's called a steering diode, um, and a Schottky diode here to prevent current flow in the forward direction. Um, and uh, it's not upside down. I think that might be upside down. I might have made an error in the figure. I think that diode should be the other way up. But yeah, you have a, you have a, a steering diode for the forward path and then a, a, an external um, inverse parallel diode. Um, I've mentioned modeling already, not going to dwell on that. There are lots of tools out there that will do it for you. Um, manufacturers often offer simple simulation tools for common topologies, and they will get you to answers on how much is the switching loss, how much is the conduction loss in a given power supply or uh, class D type amplifier configuration. Um, 
There are specialist tools. Um, Plex, for example, integrates with MATLAB, um, but they are quite expensive, as you might expect. Um, thousands of pounds a seat, typically. Um, and very often you'll find that if, if you work with the manufacturer's um, core uh, simulation programs, just for doing this, the, the, the bits that I've shown you, the switching cell simulation, and then you work with another simulator like LT Spice or P Spice or something like that, you can combine those very effectively. You can also use um, simple spreadsheet models for, for calculating losses, and I do both as a sanity check usually. Um, simple models like this are quite useful. You can use a Tevinin model for uh, the conduction losses very effectively. Typically, you end up with um, curves on the data sheet that look like this. You can draw a uh, piecewise linear approximation, and that will get you very close to a useful uh, accuracy. Um, similarly, switching losses, you can use uh, the fact that we know the peak voltage and the peak current at turn off. Um, we can therefore calculate the peak power that we see here. If we know this off time, and that's very often constant, pretty much, pretty constant for a class of devices and not doesn't very much over, over operating point, we can do um, uh, at least a first order calculation. You can do some very useful back of envelope calculations by assuming uh, the data sheet fall time um, for, for this sort of figure. Um, multiply it by two and you'll get roughly the off time because that's the time it takes for this switching transition to occur. Um, and similarly at, at turn on. Um, I, I'm assuming these slides will be available at some point somewhere else, so I won't dwell on these uh, other than to make you aware that those sort of methods do exist. And um, so in summary, the switching cell, um, it has really um, three lots of loss to think about. Um, there's the conduction losses, which are, arise when the device is on. We normally assume, incidentally, that the leakage current in the off state is, is so small as to be negligible. We, are, we have that luxury these days. Um, and then there's the dynamic or the switching losses, which are due to turn on of the switch, finite rise time, uh, capacitances in the circuit and the diodes. Uh, and the turn off losses, really, which are mainly due to the finite fall time. Of the, of the device. But don't forget about the parasitic components and the inductive components. There are things like uh, eddy current losses in, in windings and proximity losses, uh, capacitor internal series resistance, hysteresis core losses, all sorts of things like that, which um, again in power electronics can be a very big deal. Um, if you wind a switch mode power supply transformer and don't take account of the eddy current losses and the fact that the that the, um, the windings influence one another magnetically and drive the current away, effectively increase the resistance. You get a lot of heating in the winding and you can have vastly higher losses in high frequency transformers than you, you think you're going to have. Um, how do we control these switches? Well, um, everything needs, and the term is gate drive circuit. Everything needs a gate driver. It's got to provide adequate um, voltage. I'm assuming here a MOS gate device. Let's not worry about BJTs too much because of uh, their, their obsolescence. Um, we need typically 10 or 15 volts of swing on the gate of the device, a bit less if it's a logic level, but 15 volts for an IGBT, 10 for a MOSFET, 12 or so. And we need quite a lot of current to get that charge into these capacitances. And bear in mind, there's a Miller capacitor there which feeds back from the uh, from the high voltage side of the device. So that has to be charged up. And the amount of charge that goes into that is much, much greater than the capacitance would suggest at first because of the high voltage that appears here. Um, you get effectively a magnification effect, an amplification effect, even though it's a switching device. Um, it's quite commonplace, certainly in power supplies, for this lot to be referenced somewhere to mains. We'll rectify the incoming AC supply. Uh, and won't isolate it, we'll use a transformer at high frequencies to isolate that, and that's what this lot's driving. So this is going to be live. So we may well need an isolation barrier. Um, and we may well, I mentioned half bridges earlier on, just to come back to that, the high side switch, as it's called in a half bridge, and we, we have these all the time in class D amplifiers, um, you look at where the gate drive is referenced to, it's, it's, it's a gate driver that we have to provide between the gate terminal and the source or the emitter to be, if it's a IGBT, 
um, of the device. And that reference point for the drive is swinging up and down at thousands of volts per microsecond. It's probably got hundreds of volts here as well in the, when the switch is on. Um, so it's a pretty challenging condition for the gate drive circuit to have to meet. And not only um, isolation barriers struggle, but even when you don't have an isolation barrier, you're going to have to, you've got a microcontroller or some logic or small signal electronics here. That's going to have to address this gate driver, even if you don't need galvanic isolation. So you need level translation over tens or hundreds of volts, even thousands of volts. Um, so the gate drive circuit is a pretty specialized thing. Lots of nice ICs available to do it now. Optocouplers are still very common or, or, or capacitive couplers. Um, and notice as well in this circuit, importantly, that if you turn both of them on together, you short circuit the supply, and then you've got microseconds, five, 10 microseconds typically before these things destroy themselves thermally. So a shoot through fault, as it's called, is to be avoided almost at all costs. And a lot of the gate drive ICs will prevent that. And in, indeed, some may enforce what's called a dead time between the high and the low sides being on to ensure that one device turns off before the other one is ever allowed to try to turn on. Um, EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, oh, another black art that kind of isn't a black art, really. Um, you need to think about here where the currents might flow. It's very, very helpful to think about stray circuit capacitances. Um, there's one I haven't shown here, which is which is commonplace if, if you're driving a switch mode power supply transformer, lots of copper turns and windings um, adjacent to one another for good magnetic coupling. So you've got quite a lot of capacitance between primary and secondary, and those are a copious source of capacitive displacement current. Remember that equation I equals C dV by dt, um, the current flowing in all these stray capacitance is proportional to the rate of change of voltage. We're switching very fast to avoid losses and switching at very high frequencies to keep magnetics small. And so we can get a lot of current flowing in stray capacitances through things like um, insulation washers on transistors, um, PCB substrates, um, transformer windings and so on. So there's lots of attention needed to think about where those currents flow and to make sure that they have a return path and they don't flow, for example, from a wall warp power supply, a plug-in power supply, um, through your laptop and into your audio equipment that's coupled to the laptop, which you're using to you know, record uh, a symphony orchestra or something. Um, electrostatic screens, very good in transformers. Y class capacitors, safety capacitors are commonly used to ensure that where these high frequency currents get out into the metalwork, they return quickly back to the power supply from whence they came. And I would always encourage people to read AES 48, uh, which is a lovely document all about um, where ground currents flow and why you shouldn't tie screens to um, in internals of electronics without thinking about it very carefully. Everybody should read it. I gave everybody um, instructions to do so when I was a technical director in a motor drive company because it was such a good uh, grounding, no pun intended. Um, okay, application examples. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I need to move on because time is pressing and uh, everybody will be wanting to get to the bar, even if it's virtual. Um, I'll go through a few example power supply topologies just, just to illustrate the kind of things I've been talking about. Um, again, lots of information about these in both books and on the net, so I'm not going to spend too much time on each one. Um, this one um, is called the flyback converter. Um, it's very much akin, I think it's called a flyback actually, because really it's, it's the topology that was used in that TV set that I showed you all those years ago, where the spot on the CRT, the cathode ray tube screen, had to fly back to the other side of the screen and the energy was captured and reused. And the same principle here, we've driving current through an inductor, storing it in the inductor. This is the critical part about the flyback. And then when we turn the switch off, the energy that was in the inductor, the half Li squared in there, diverts into D and flows into C0, the output capacitor. So it's a bit like dunking an inductive bucket into the DC power supply on the input side, carrying the bucket over to the output and then tipping the energy into that capacitor. Um, so the throughput of this is fundamentally limited by 
the amount of energy you can store in that inductor and the switching frequency. You can't go beyond half Li squared F, basically. You can run the thing in continuous current mode so that the current doesn't reach zero each cycle. That gives you a bigger energy transfer because it's the difference between two squares. But otherwise, the principle remains the same. Um, they're very widely used in small power supplies. Your washing machine's probably got something like this in it to run the micro and the display. Um, TV sets, small plug-in power supplies, that kind of thing. And um, not massively efficient because uh, of the all of the energy being stored and then dumped again. Um, and you get quite a lot of switching loss because when you turn off this switch, the voltage here rises to uh, quite a high value. Um, it's more commonly seen in this guise, which looks very different, but actually isn't. We've simply avoided the placement of the output capacitor on the positive supply rail, which means that the output either has to be taken at V0 greater than the input, fine if you want to boost. Um, but if you want a low voltage output reference to naught volts, you have to um, transform a couplet. Uh, and the leakage current in the transformer then become, sorry, the leakage inductance of the transformer then becomes a bit of a, a nuisance, a lot of a nuisance, because when you open the switch, there's nowhere for the stored energy in the core to go. Um, not all of the magnetic field links the secondary and that which doesn't basically causes voltage overshoots on the primary side. So you end up having to capture that in um, Zener diodes or resistor capacitor networks and basically burn it off as heat. Not great for efficiency. Um, better is this one, the forward converter, where instead the, the key difference here, to forget about the details, the key difference here is that we are using this wound component as a transformer. Here I would strongly argue this isn't really a transformer it's as i say it's an inductor it's an inductive bucket it happens to be double wound but it is still an inductor here the inductance of the transformer is parasitic we don't actually need any inductance what we or what we want to do is to couple the primary voltage which we switch on here through to the secondary where it's then filtered we pulse with modulate the switch and we end up with a square wave train here which then gets filtered by the lc network and as we increase the duty cycle, the output voltage increases. It's a voltage sourced converter, in other words, whereas this is kind of, the flyback is kind of current sourced really. Um, and because it's a single ended converter with a single switch, um, we have to have some means of getting the small amount of energy, but nevertheless, the, the, the magnetic flux in the core has to be gotten out. Uh, and it's done by a tertiary winding on the transformer. Very common in the 70s and 80s for power supplies, less common these days because of the topologies are available and more efficient. Um, and another variation on that is to simply connect kind of two of these back to back, two forward converters back to back. Um, and in, now the transformer sees alternating flux naturally, inherently. Uh, we don't need the reset winding. And of course it makes better use of the transformer because we're transferring power both on the on stroke, if you like, of this switch and on the on stroke of the of the other switch. We're transferring energy all the time if we're at a, a full duty cycle. A nice low ripple on the output, um, lots of variations on, on, on this particular design. You can make it resonant by tying capacitors in, in appropriate places. Um, and that leads us to um, this uh, type of design. Um, which is uh, a half bridge version of the same thing. Uh, all we've done here is instead of having two switches referenced to ground, uh, nice and convenient for gate driving, we've driven it instead from uh, a half bridge circuit so we can swing the voltage at the, this, the lower terminal of the transformer up and down to naught and to plus V in. Uh, there's a center tap on the uh, capacitors here that provides a convenient midpoint on the power supply. Nice thing about this is you don't have to worry about leakage inductance in the transformer um, and it uses a simpler transformer. You need a center tap on the capacitors on the power supply but that's no real uh, burden. Um, but all of these converters are, um, are hard switched. There's a full bridge version of the same thing uh, and again I don't want to labor all of this and read all this at leisure in any of the textbooks or online. Um, but there is an important point, and if I if I put my if I were to, and I'm I'm not proposing to, but if I were to put my name to a sort of law of power electronics, I would say that it's the case that there's never less than a certain minimum volt ampere product needed. If you look at this 
uh, topology, the, the half bridge converter. Um, each switch sees the full input voltage, um, but the transformer only ever sees plus or minus half of it. If we go to a full bridge, the switches have the same voltage rating, um, but now the transformer sees twice the voltage, and so we can we can transfer twice the power for the same switch rating. But we need four of them, so two switches, one unit of power, if you like, four switches, two units of power. Well, kind of figures, doesn't it? In other words, it's there's no such thing as a free lunch, and lots of people spent a lot of time coming up with different topologies that only use one switch, for example. But actually, you you always find that. Um, if you halve the number of switches, for example, you always need at least twice the VA, the volt ampere product in the switch rating. And it was a good idea in the early days when the control electronics to operate the switches was expensive. But these days when gate drive and, uh, and, and small signal drive circuits are cheap and readily available, it makes rather less sense. Um, one final thing on, I think it's final, not quite final, on on um, on the hard switch converters, at least synchronous rectification. Um, all of these power supplies I've shown you have diode rectifiers to convert the alternating output back to DC again, assuming that that's what you want. Um, and of course, diodes, silicon diodes drop 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a volt when they're conducting and they have losses, therefore significant losses. And you can improve upon that by using that MOSFET body diode I mentioned. Why? How? Well, if we look at the MOSFET structure, it's actually very symmetrical. There's nothing that says we have to put positive current into the drain and out of the source. Um, we can drive it the other way around. The only thing that gets in the way of us using it fully symmetrically is that body diode. But actually, we want to short circuit that and use that as a, a rectifier. So if we turn, if we put a MOSFET in this in this rectifier position and apply gate drive in just the normal way to the MOSFET whenever we think that diode should be on, um, then we can reduce the forward drop of that diode to whatever the MOSFET channel resistance allows. And in doing so, you can reduce the rectification losses in a supply like this uh, very dramatically. But you need to provide gate drive to another two switches. And in this particular instance, in an awkward place, reference to the transformer primary connections. So again, no such thing as a free lunch, but a widely used technique these days to get higher efficiency. Quite important. The other thing that's improving efficiency dramatically these days is the use of what's called resonant conversion. Again, there's a finagle of different topologies here. This is one I like particularly. Um, can be used with a bridge rectifier on the output, of course. Doesn't have to be a biphase two diode rectifier with a center tap. Um, but essentially, what we do is we take a half bridge converter, produce square waves with it here, um, and we apply those square waves to a resonant tank circuit as it's called and that tank circuit's usually made of a single film capacitor a few hundreds of tens or hundreds of nanofarads um, and the leakage reactance of the transformer the inductance that's already built into the transformer and by tuning that resonant tank we can get uh, resonant behavior in in the current and what what you usually do is we normally drive these with a square wave at high frequency typically 100 200 300 kilohertz or more um, with uh, the frequency beyond resonance and that means that this tank circuit is essentially looks inductive as far as uh, the, the half bridge driving it's concerned the current in it which is pretty sinusoidal um, lags behind the applied voltage and that's important very important because it means when you turn the switch off um, the the current doesn't um have to be forced to drive the sorry i want to say this the, the current continues to flow um and it charges up the switch capacitances and brings the opposite diode into conduction naturally without having to turn on the opposing switch and sorry that's a bit of a mouthful um but it is it is necessary and important to drive above resonance to get that effect you get essentially lossless switching um, as far as um, the dynamic losses are concerned, still have the on-state conduction losses, but essentially you get lossless switching of these MOSFETs. Very, very nice arrangement. Um, and because this essentially looks like an inductor, if we turn the frequency up, we get more voltage drop across here and the output voltage drops. So by simply controlling the frequency, and there are again nice little eight pin chips that will do this for cost next to nothing, 
Um, by controlling the frequency in a closed loop arrangement, you have a voltage reference and an error amplifier on the output and an input on the chip that controls the frequency of oscillation, we can regulate the output within reasonable bounds. The only limitation of this circuit, as it's shown here, is that at no load, there's no voltage drop to speak of, or not much anyway, across this tank circuit. And so the ability to regulate at light load is somewhat limited. And there are alternative versions of this with a, with the, with a instead of a series resonant, what's called shunt resonance, and there are series shunt or series parallel resonant versions as well, all quite similar. And there's a very nice paper by a guy called Bob Steigerwald who uh, um, really laid down the analysis of this in a very readable and, and nice form. And if you're interested in this topology, I'd very much encourage you to look that up. Um, deep breath onto the last stretch. We're only a little bit over time, so I hope Sue will forgive me. Um, Class D amplification. Um, that's, of course, the biggest use, perhaps, of, of switching electronics with the most direct audio application. But of course, we shouldn't forget that actually most audio kit these days, even if it's analog, even if it's linear electronics, a lot of it still has switch mode power supplies in of the kinds that I've shown you. So they are relevant to our world, even if we don't pay very much attention to them, we buy them off the shelf, perhaps. Um, the Class D amplifier, it is formed of generally speaking, the half bridge circuit that I showed you before. We switch S1 and S2 alternately uh, with pulse width modulation to vary the average voltage at the bridge output. Um, we can connect two bridges, um, one on each side of the load, and drive the audio voltage in opposite phase to create twice the output voltage from the given supply rail. Very common for uh, automotive applications, for example, where you've not got much supply rail available, and it avoids all the audio current having to flow through these capacitors too. Um, what to say about this? Um, it's necessary to have an output filter, and if we don't have an output filter like Clive Sinclair didn't in his X10, then we can expect trouble in the load. We're going to set fire to the tweeter, probably uh, ignite the crossover network and certainly put a lot of eddy current loss into the, into the magnet structure. So we do need an output filter to reconstruct the output waveform. Um, that has some voltage drop across it, and there's a bit of a compromise to be struck in the classic Class D amplifier uh, between the the cutoff frequency of the output filter and the audio bandwidth you know if we have a uh, a 500 kilohertz switching frequency we might have a, a cutoff of i don't know 50 kilohertz in the output filter maybe 100 um maybe less but there will be some roll off of the audio band response because of this output filter um you get around that of course by using higher and higher switching frequencies but then you have more and more losses as we've seen before in the output stage um the what else was I going to say about the output filter? Um, things to be careful of um, in this design, um, the phase shift of the output filter, uh, what it was I wanted to say to you, uh, is a problem in negative feedback. Uh, if you want to apply lots of negative feedback to linearize the output stage, and there are very good reasons for needing to do that, as we'll see in a minute. Um, the output filter phase shift, whilst the amplitude response may be only a dB or so down, not, not very severe, the phase response of the filter is very detrimental to the stability of uh, high amounts of negative feedback. And so we have to be very careful about that. And people do a lot of work in designing high order feedback loops to try and circumvent that. Um, the very nice solution proposed to that in the, in the early noughties was by Bruno Putzes at Hypex, and at Philips, in fact, when he came up with the idea. And it's one of those that um, is so straightforward that you wish you'd thought of it. And that's the genius of it, of course. And that's to make the output filter part of a self oscillating amplifier so that um, you take the feedback uh, raw and it works as audio negative feedback at low frequencies. And it serves to, to actually make the amplifier oscillate at high frequencies. A very nice solution. Uh, and all credit to, to Bruno for coming up with that. Um, issues in Class D amplifiers. Well, I mentioned before about shoot through faults. Uh, you've got to be very careful not to turn these two on together because we'll get a huge amount of loss and it may even be destructive if we do it repetitively or for too long. Um, so we have dead time, as it's called, between the high and the low side switch. 
And that dead time means it messes about with the duty cycle, essentially, of the amplifier in ways that are, are, are not necessarily all that obvious. Um, and we end up with quite unpleasant distortion if we're not careful. You end up with several different modes where the current is crossing zero, where it's just kissing zero, and then when it's continuous. Um, and you can end up with rather crossover distortion like waveforms. Those of you familiar with class AB amps will know I will know exactly what I mean by that when you see these waveforms. Quite hard to eliminate by feedback because the loop gain drops to zero in these flat spots. Um, and therefore um, quite uh, quite an important source of distortion. You know, dead time is not great. And, and there are amplifier topologies that have been developed. I think Crown came up with one that uh, that actually avoid it altogether and actually um, put an inductor between the two devices and deliberately fire them both together to avoid having this dead time issue. Quite a clever solution. Um, there are other nasties in here. It's vulnerable to sort of uh, onion ring analysis, much as Douglas Self very nicely did for the Class AB amplifier in his series of books and Wireless World articles some years ago. Um, there are a number of sources. I'm sure I've not got all of them. Maybe somebody can can do the same job and write a book about all of this one day. Um, but you have direct connection of the output to the load. There's nothing to isolate that other than negative feedback or feed forward if you can use that. Um, and if you modulate both rails, if they both go up and down together, you'll get amplitude modulation of the output. Uh, if one rail moves and the other one doesn't, it couples through to the load directly, that common mode component. So um, hash from the power supplies can get in in various ways. Um, if the PWM isn't generated cleanly, if you're using analog PWM, you can get noise in the comparator, jitter in the clock and so on. Um, and there's also a well-known problem in single-ended class D where the supply capacitors are connected like this from a bridge rectifier, where uh, if you put DC, for example, through the amplifier, a bit of DC offset, then essentially what you'll be doing is robbing power from one half of the supply and, and driving it into the other, and you'll end up pumping up one rail at the expense of the other. Um, that doesn't happen in the full bridge connection because of the symmetry of it. Um, noise shaping as well, uh, close to Jamie's heart, very useful in the modulator. I've seen a number of designs that use that. Um, and I'm, I, time isn't with me, so I'm not going to dwell on this very simple model, but I just wanted to show you some waveforms that I'd created in this simple model. Um, the, the behavior of this class D output stage is actually quite subtle in a number of ways in terms of its losses. And this is important when we start to compare the efficiency of class D amps with those of traditional linear amplifiers. Um, because we say, oh, a class D amplifiers are 95% efficient. Well, yes, they are at full load if you design them well. But when you're there off load, you've got potentially 500 kilohertz switching or something of that order. Um, and this circuit may be consuming quite a lot if we're not careful about the switching losses. Um, fortunately, it has rather like the series resonant converter, which it very much resembles, actually, you've got an inductive output filter. And that means that the ripple current in the inductor at light load when you're around the zero crossings of the waveform is lagging behind the voltage. And we get, as a result of that, soft switching, resonance zero, zero loss resonant switching around the zero crossings, which is quite nice. Um, but as soon as the current stops reversing each PWM cycle, as soon as it sort of kisses zero, which if I show here, um, this is this is a full load case where we've got lots of volts on the output, a little bit of ripple on, in the inductor as a fraction of the audio frequency current. But at, at very low signal levels, we've got loads of ripple. It's still the same magnitude as before, more or less, but it's relative to the audio waveform, it's now large. And that means that the current is reversing, we get lost with switching. But that stops happening uh, in this instance. So at some points in the waveform, we'll have loss, less switching. But in most of it, we'll have switching losses. And that transition between no switching losses and substantial switching losses occurs dependent on the magnitude of the input waveform and the magnitude of the ripple in that output inductor. So it's got a few interesting little details uh, we haven't got time to study them any depth here at all, but just be aware that they exist. 
Um, and Jamie Angus, our own Jamie, thank you, Jamie, did a very nice job a few years ago of picking this question up and looking at it in a bit more detail and saying, well, with these switching losses and with the um, probability density that we have in audio waveforms, meaning that we spend a lot of time around zero, actually the high sine wave efficiency of a class D amplifier is not necessarily the benefit that it first appears to be. Um, it's undeniably useful in high power PA amps for nightclubs and that kind of thing, um, where you know you just have to have enormous heat sinks and they would be expensive and bulky. Um, but in a domestic situation, maybe not so obvious. It's not um, very obvious to me that uh, a class D hi-fi amplifier or a new TV is necessarily a green benefit. Um, it's probably beneficial in other ways in terms of size and weight, and it packs a lot of power into a small space, which is that's certainly a good reason for using it. Um, but green, mm, not so not so sure. Depends on so many different factors. Um, read the papers that by Jamie, uh, and she may well if, uh, you know want to comment on that, or I'm sure we'll be happy to answer any questions on that at the end. Um, one other thing that always strikes me looking at this stuff as well is how high the stresses are in the components compared with our old. Um, I'm, I'm, I count myself as an old timer now, um, and I look at amplifiers from the 50s and 60s with their 50 hertz transformers and rectifier diodes, and everything still works in them. Even the output capacitors are often functional after decades. I do wonder about the high levels of stresses that are constantly in, in, in place in these little switching supplies and switch mode amplifiers and wonder whether we'll be able to fix classic class D amplifiers in 50 years time. We'll see. Um, just to show what can be done, um, I, I hope my friend Dave Millard at Full Fat Audio will forgive me for using this picture. I didn't actually ask him. Uh, so, Dave, if you're there, I hope you don't mind me giving you a bit of a plug. Um, this is uh, a Full Fat Audio, eight kilowatts. And the reason it's impressive to me is that it's got good audio performance, very nicely packaged. And it's eight kilowatts in a 2U 19 inch rack. You can pick that up under one arm and, and walk out to a gig with it. Um, our next door neighbours would have been terrified had they known I had one. <laughs> would have made a lot of noise with that, perhaps not for very long. Um, finish with a, a very, very quick chat about the future. Um, I did think about getting lots of pictures, but I knew I'd just run out of time. Um, why band gap semiconductors? There's been a huge amount of talk about these in the power electronics industry for sure, and I think it's leaked out into other areas. Um, why band gap? Because the junction band gap, the the, the 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 voltage you have to apply basically to break the semiconductor down uh, is much higher in in uh, these new uh, compound devices, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, that kind of thing, three times or so, I think, and the thermal conductivity is better too, so you can get more heat out of them, um, and they switch faster, so they they're, they're better in a number of different areas. Um, they pay for themselves. Well, do they pay for themselves? That's the question. Um, they pay for themselves, I think, by allowing you to use higher frequencies, which means that you can put smaller transformers in, smaller filters, particularly solar was a really big solar inverters for you know the things you put on your roof uh, that transform 50 volts DC or so and put it on the grid. You can't put hundreds of kilohertz or tens of kilohertz PWM uh, on the grid you need a filter. Uh, the national grid get very upset about it, understandably. So do your neighbours uh, and so do your light fittings with capacitors in them and things. So you have to filter that PWM out. If you're running um, bipolar type switches at a few kilohertz, those filters have to be um, iron cord inductors, big can capacitors. They're expensive, they're bulky. Um, if you go to 100 kilohertz with a, with a, a a GAN FET or a silicon carbide device, uh, then you've got the opportunity to use much, much smaller ferrite cord chokes, uh, smaller capacitors, and, and add to that the fact that the thing is probably more efficient, uh, smaller heat sinks. You've got easily a benefit that justifies the probably five times cost that you're going to pay for the uh, semiconductors in today's money. That costs falling. The improvements in manufacturing technology are happening slowly but steadily um, and 
we will see these devices creeping into more and more applications. Class D audio, of course, is a great example because there we are by the fact that we need 20K bandwidth and more. Um, we need high switching frequencies by definition. Um, so high frequency capable devices are, are very attractive to us for that purpose. And GAN FETs particularly and silicon carbide FETs, perhaps a bit less, those are more suitable for higher voltages. Uh, will certainly be seen and, and are being used indeed today. Um, I, I rather unkindly drew the, I think this is called the Gartner hype cycle, isn't it? Uh, which applies to lots of things, you know, it applied to uh, 3D printing. We were all of us going to get 3D printed houses at one time, if you listen to the punters. Um, but eventually it settles down and people realise what it's useful for and what it's not useful for and start to use it sensibly. And wide band gap or compound semiconductors in power electronics have gone through a similar thing that they were going to save the planet. Um, well, nobody would argue that saving energy is a bad thing, but you do need to sort of, comp uh, what's the word, um, put it in context by uh, considering that a high efficiency silicon based power supply or inverter might well be 97% efficient already. And going to 99% is great, but you are only shaving a couple of percent off the power consumption. The important point again is that that 97 to 99% transition is a reduction by two thirds in the heat losses, and therefore it saves you on heat sinks and case size and all that sort of thing. So we'll see, I think, lots more developments coming. Um, I, I will be the first to adopt them if, if they get inexpensive, but for now, silicon is likely to uh, remain, I think, dominant in a lot of applications, simply because it's such darn good value for money and it's still improving. Um, and finally, just this is finally just to show off a little bit. This is a, a GAN based converter that I've been working on over the last few months. It's part of a, a, a wind generator controller, actually. Um, the 20p bit share there shows, I hope, some size of it. It's the chip there is about 10 millimeters square. Um, there's a, a almost no passives this, with, with it because the chip includes gate drive, it includes protection. It's got a level shifter for driving the high side device. Um, it's got uh, power supply arrangements to provide the high side supply for the, for the gate driver. Um, very, very heavily integrated. And it switches in conjunction with these two little inductors on the back side of the board. The whole volume is probably about, I don't know, four or five cubic centimeters, something like that. So it has a power density of, of depending on how you, you measure with the measure the power and, and what operating point of, of something like up to 100 kilowatts per litre, which is going some. Um, it's a little bit of an unfair metric in some ways because I'm not swinging the voltage over a very wide range. It's kind of 50 to 300 volts output from a 300 volt supply. So um, it's not quite doing the same job as say a class D amplifier would do. But nevertheless, it's it scared the hell out of me. I have to say when I first switched it on and did all the calculations, uh, and thought it would work, but nevertheless, you do wonder when you first apply power and crank it up, is this thing going to blow? Happily, it didn't. Um, few books. Um, there are not very many um, user-friendly books in, in power electronics. There's a lot of, um, no disrespect to the IEEE, but a lot of highly complex highly analytical studies of power converters with um, small signal analyses and all sorts of things. Um, but for sort of hands-on, um, there are a handful of sort of suggestions here. The art of electronics, don't neglect that. People rather unkindly sneer at it, I think, because it tells you actually how to do things rather than necessarily going into the details of why and how. Um, but that's got quite a nice summary. There are, uh, the classic book was for many years, the one by Keith Billings, that's been updated fairly recently. I'm not sure whether that's still in print, but look that out. Uh, and there's a handful of others. I'm sure we can put these on the chat or um, if Sue makes the slides available afterwards, we can, we can share that. Um, thank you very much. I have run rather over time as I feared I might, but I hope that's been interesting, um, at least to give you a flavor of, of what power electronics is and how it's relevant to our world of audio. Um, and I believe we'll take questions in the webinar rather than jumping over to a chat room. But Jamie, um, we don't actually have any questions in the webinar. Um, <laughs> so I think the best thing to do would be to jump over the chat. And as I said earlier, 
Um, yes, thank you very much, Mike. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a virtual clap that I'm afraid you won't hear. <laughs> but um, we're going to now transfer people to have privileges in the Zoom session to talk and participate. Um, as I said right at the beginning, uh, you keep an eye on Zoom and stay in Zoom. You should get a little note that says uh, uh, you're being asked to be a participant rather than um, or, or something like that. And um, you've got to say yes to become part of it. So uh, may I suggest uh, we gradually uh, move towards the bar and um, all being well, this will work and you can um, participate. Um, just say yes to becoming a participant. Thank you. Right, some of us have made it. Uh, um, I don't know how many other people will, uh, but all being well, they will. If anybody wants to ask a question while other people are joining, thank you very much, Sue, for doing what you're doing. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you, Jamie, for all the introduction and everything. Oh, do I need to do anything in terms of jumping across to a chat no, room? Or, no, I'm you're just here. here and, uh, we are already here. And, it's and listen the to people the jumping to, we, Believe it or not, we started in the bar, Mike. Um, <laughs> not a lot of people knew that. Um, uh, I was intrigued by the volume that you proposed for that example. Uh, it didn't even form a decent shot of whiskey. No, that's right. As I say, it was, it was a real, a real clenched buttocks moment. I'd done all the calculations on it that kind of said, yes, this will work. And the, the, the client involved needed a variable voltage. It's actually to reduce eddy currents in a permanent hmm. generator. We've got an inverter driving a generator and we've got quite a lot of eddy current loss, relatively hmm. speaking, in the in the <coughs> electric machine, much as you get in a speaker. Um, and we needed to reduce that and the way to do it was to reduce the supply voltage to the inverter. So we needed a, not only a, a, a voltage converter, but a bi-directional one that would carry current either way. Um, and it looked like this little half bridge would do it very, very simple, but it's all software controlled and credit to my colleague, Steve Jackson, who, who made it all work and only blew up one device, I think, in, in testing it all. Um, but it was it was a hell of a scary thing when we got to sort of 500 watts flowing through that. And you're thinking um, old style Star Trek Scotty, you know, she's going to blow, Jim. Um, right. but fortunately, fortunately, so far, not very, very uh, impressive. Not not because of my design, but because of the, the performance of the GAN chip. Right. Cool. So do people have questions? There is a raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. You should all be able to see if you want to um, uh, raise your hand, then I can be a bit order. Right. Hans van Manen, um, what's your question? Well, I, I thank you very much, uh, Mark, to begin with. But um, I'm a bit confused about the, the losses. Um, uh, you say smaller transformers uh, are more smaller, uh, higher frequencies, uh, but don't the capacitive uh, losses increase at higher frequencies? And the second question related to is that uh, if I remember right, you said at one moment that you assumed that the losses from coils were virtually zero, uh, but I always understood that because of the resistance of coils, uh, they were more lossy than capacitors. So did I get you wrong or am I overlooking something? Um, um, okay, yes, great, good, good, great questions, Hans. Thank you and thank you for joining us all the way from, from Holland. Um, yeah, capacitive losses. I'm, I'm not sure whether you're referring to losses in the passive components around the converter or in the devices themselves. Um, both, of course, are, are relevant. Uh, did, did you have one of those in mind, particularly? Well, with transformers, you have a uh, capacitance between the different okay. windings. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The inter yeah, okay. The, so you, you're speaking about parasitics in the in the surrounding components. Yes, those do get bigger. Um, I'm sorry, not bigger. They get more significant. Sorry. Let's let's be very careful with with how we put that. The losses um, due to those are are not really. A, big deal i'll come back to the losses but um just in terms of coupling 
um, that they are a nuisance, very much a nuisance. And I did think I, I referred to them in my very brief mention of EMC, probably too brief. Um, if you've got a switching converter driving a high frequency, particularly a ferrite cord transformer, then the capacitance between the primary and the secondary will for sure couple um, every time the converter switches, you'll see a spike, a common mode spike on the output. Um, and as, as with so much common mode crap, once it gets into the rest of your equipment, it's very hard to get rid of it. So it's very useful to put a Faraday shield in there, um, basically in the middle of the plates of the capacitor, if you like. Um, there are interwinding capacitances as well that, that um, introduce um, resonance in the transformer at some point. The happy thing is that with the frequency going up and up and up, we have fewer and fewer turns in the windings um, for the same magnetic flux in the core. And we also um, have uh, smaller and smaller transformers. So the physical size of the capacitor plates, if you will, you know, that, that, that are formed by the windings are, are also decreasing. So capacitance in transformers, one shouldn't forget about it, but it's not uh, a killer problem um, as such. Um, what is a problem is if you have to discharge and charge capacitances, whether they're in transformers or inductors. Um, and I mentioned output device capacitance, a typical MOSFET, um, the kind of thing that was on that little PCB that I showed you at the end, um, those GANFETs have, the data sheet says 35 picofarads, I think, of output capacitance. Um, I reckon it's more than that based on power losses, no disrespect to the manufacturer, I think it's more like 50 or 60. Um, that might not sound very much, and indeed in some metrics it isn't, but if you're charging that capacitor by um, turning a switch on rather than allowing the uh, inductance, inductive current to do it, if you're charging it through uh, the other, if you're charging, say, a low side capacitor through the high side switch in, a, in an H bridge, um, you're losing half CV squared energy each time you turn the, the switch on. And then when the opposite switch turns on, it discharges the capacitor again and you lose another half CV squared. Um, and you're doing that over two switches. So you end up with two CV squared F. Um, and I'm not going to fire up Microsoft's horrible calculator to, to calculate what that is, but CV squared F at, say, 100 kilohertz with um, a, a 50 picofarad capacitance um, is still, you know, a handful of watts. And in context of an application where efficiency at light load was very important, which this was, um, you know, an odd watt or two is very, very significant. So output capacitances in MOSFETs particularly are a pain um, and are more of a pain as you go up in frequency. The, the knack as with so many things in engineering is to make uh, what you can't control irrelevant, um, you know, bypass it in some way. And, and that is in, to use resonance switching to, to uh, use the resonance of that capacitance with, with a, an inductor somewhere to swing the voltage and current during the high to low side and low to high side dead time transition. Um, and then you can end up with, instead of that capacitor being a nuisance, it's almost your friend. It, it becomes a useful thing because it reduces rates of change of voltage and reduces RFI. Um, so yeah, long answer on capacitive losses, but yeah, a lot of things to consider. You mentioned uh, losses in coils, um, inductors, hands. Um, DC losses in those um, are generally very small of necessity. One has to wind them out of thick enough wire. Um, and if you're using um, very high frequencies with high currents, you'll probably end up using Litz wire, Litzendraht, uh, I think it's a German word, but where you have a, wind, a winding up that's quite thick, but wound a bit like a rope, or twisted like a rope out of many individual strands. And that's to reduce skin effect losses. Um, the biggest evil I think people trip over, and I, I, I've tripped over it myself very early in my career and got burned literally by it, is what's called proximity loss. Um, in a switch mode, well, in any, in any transformer, um, you have fairly high concentrations of magnetic fields, magnetic flux, um, and that flux interacts with the current in the conductors. And effectively, it, the finite element shows this really nicely, it displaces the current out of the windings. So you end up with 
um, a lot more effectively skin loss it's kind of like skin losses but it's it's much greater than you would calculate just by having a long piece of wire from one end of the room to the other and putting high frequency down you can measure the resistance of that it goes up with frequency that skin effect where the, con the conduction happens on the surface of the conductor um, but if you wind a transformer from that wire um, the effects of neighboring conductors on each other and effects of magnetic flux concentration, for example, around the air gap in an inductor, you get a lot of flux around the air gap that will cause um, eddy current heating and, and um, losses in the windings way, way, way more than you'd get from skin effect. And that can be a real, real problem in getting um, high power density out of an inductor. Um, you're also swinging the magnetic field up and down in the core. Ideally, you'd like to go all the way to the saturation capabilities of the magnetics. But as you swing the, the field back and forth, you get um, eddy current losses, particularly you get some hysteresis loss as well. That tends to be fairly small. But the eddy current losses that are induced in the core, um, again, are often a, a significant factor in high frequency magnetics. So, yeah, resistive losses are assumed usually to be low. They have to be because otherwise you're just wasting power as I squared R loss. Um, but those other um, hidden resistances, if you like, they're, they're much the same as the, the kind of things you get in loudspeakers that mean a, the voice coil isn't really inductive at high frequencies. It's, it's a sort of semi-inductance and it's the same effects that you get there. Um, and of course, in, in, a, in a wound inductor, we, we kind of laminate the core, if you like, by making it out of ferrite and laminate it for kilohertz frequencies. We make them out of ferrite or dust iron or... Um, um, exotic um, tape type foil windings and things like that. There's all sorts of strange magnetic materials that can be used at higher frequencies to, to circumvent those losses. Did I answer your question, Hans, deep breath and pause for water? <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was a very extensive answer. Um, it, it really um, helped me, but um, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I try to avoid transformers and coils as much as possible because of all this misery. But uh, thanks for the explanation. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Can can we have another question, please? Are there any others? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there are other questions. Why did everybody with science or bored everybody to death or or no? You haven't bored haven't bored everyone, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I think you're being kind. <laughs> oh, no, I'm afraid it's a bit too much for for we here. But um, fascinating. It's an area I don't know anywhere near enough about. Well, thank Other you, Jeff. I'm glad, it was, I'm glad it was interesting. Other questions? Anybody, anything else? Oh, Gary. Gary Endler, please. Hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a couple of questions, and um, I have implemented a number of Class D amplifiers on small um, IoT type consumer products, but uh, there's there are some questions that are, are are still kind of lingering that I would really like your opinion on. Um, the first question is, um, I wonder if you could comment on if there are any advantages of integrating the power supply with the Class D amp. Um, I can think of some sort of like maybe better efficiency or size or performance. And the second question is, it occurs to me that if this may be straining for NATs, but the residual ripple on the output of a class D app, I wondered if that could possibly act as sort of a dithering signal in the same way of a bias oscillator on a tape recorder that might help linearize the distortion from magnetic hysteresis due to uh, you know, the ferromagnetic materials in the output filter or the, even the uh, speaker driver. So um, oh. love to hear your, uh, <laughs> your ideas about those. Oh my goodness. Well, I think, I think you're, you're probably ahead of me on, on, on both of those, Gary, but um, take the second one first. Um, that's a very interesting suggestion. Um, I haven't ever heard anybody suggest that, and uh, I would really need to pass that over to a magnetics expert to comment on that. Um, 
I, I know uh, Jack Oakley Brown at KEF was planning on joining. I, I, I also know he, he said he had to leave at about 8.15. So unfortunately, I suspect he's not on the call anymore, but he would certainly be he's able not. to. He's not, sadly. He would certainly have um, something to say about that. Jeff, uh, Jeff Hill also is a speaker's expert. No disrespect to anybody else who's on the call. I don't want to leave anybody else's name out. If there are speak loud speaker experts, uh, other are speaker experts on the call. I've not heard of that one. Uh, but Sorry, an interesting I, didn't, I didn't catch the uh, the question, Mike, exactly. So I, I, I think if I, if I paraphrase it, Gary's talking about um, the distortions, and, and they've been in the press recently, actually, with um, one of the speaker makers, I forget which one now, um, talking about how to deal with hysteresis type distortions uh, in, in caused by magnetics in the speaker. Um, so, or magnetics in the output filter. True, um, yes, good point. Once, yeah. um, the speaker has a known solution, which is the conducting rings and the uh, driver. So if, oh. if, if, what, if you left the conductive rings out and instead um, used the high frequency dither to um, go round the hysteresis loop many, many times, could one eliminate the hysteresis related distortion? Very oh. interesting question. I, 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 honestly... I, I would suggest that if you want to learn about something there, you look at the recent work that uh, Purify have done. Mm. Um, they will the give you some very good guides as to what to do, because it's one of the areas that they concentrate on quite a lot. I do cover it to a very small extent in my book, but Purify are pretty well at the bleeding edge of it. That's the name I was trying to remember, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, 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 that's leave that. um, I think the Purify amp is still based on the 2005 Barcelona play paper plus extra bits. Yeah, but the um, the loudspeakers, um, oh, which is my area, um, they they do a lot of work on the magnetic hysteresis and how that is con controlled as well. I I couldn't comment on. On their on their electronic side, but they definitely do on, on on the on the speaker side. So you've got conductive rings, plus you've got the uh, magnetic circuit. You've got not just B BLX, LEX, but IX as well. So you're into the sorts of switching um, currents and domains that Mike was talking about. Right. Hmm. I think that's a really interesting question. I'd never, I'd never, never thought of that one. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go to, I'll go to thinking about that. Go to bed thinking about that one, Gary. Um, but sorry, that's not, that's not really much of an answer for you. But at least it's a pointer, perhaps, for further research. Um, it certainly seems plausible. The, the other question you asked was uh, about integrating the power supply with the amplifier. Um, my first thought on that is, I mean, it, it's certainly done um, in the motor drives world where I spent some considerable time. Um, big stuff. You have, there's, there's, a, there's a group at Nottingham University led by a chap called Pat Wheeler um, who came up with a thing called a matrix converter. Um, and that sought to sort of bypass the intermediate DC link, as it's often called, you know, the typical trap, the classical um, structure for any of these things, whether it's an amplifier or uh, an inverter or whatever, is to take the incoming AC supply from the wall, rectify it to DC, um, and then to convert the DC back to AC, whether it's at uh, a fixed frequency for running a motor or whether it's audio. Um, and Pat's team worked on, on structures that allowed you to basically take AC power and route it directly to the machine windings at a different frequency and different voltage using quite complex and quite clever bi-directional switching devices and things like that. Um, it works quite well. I mean, the, the reason for doing it on, on in motor drive world was, was to save on the size and weight and bulk of the DC link, as it's called, the rectifier capacitors and so on. So you didn't have this thumping great energy storage lump in the middle 
Um, and it, and I, I think they are used on things like aircraft, aer aerospace type application, where obviously size and weight is everything. Um, for audio purposes, um, I, I would think that the, the biggest issue is that the, I, I assume we're talking about an AC supply here. Um, it might, might be different with a with a DC supply. And if, you, if you're talking about, say, a battery and you need to boost that up, maybe the amplifier could be made to do that and amplify at the same time. Um, but if it's an AC supply, then you've got 50 or 60 hertz coming in and every zero crossing, um, assuming that the current is reasonably in phase with the voltage, the power available goes to zero. Um, and that's why you need those big electrolytic capacitors, whether they be on the high voltage side at the front end of a switcher um, or whether they're you know, on a conventional diode bridge after a toroidal transformer or something, an EI transformer. Um, so I can't see a ready way of, of, of attractively doing that. Um, I would have thought the pain and suffering involved would probably be more than, more than uh, it would be worth. Um, maybe, as I say, if you were thinking about, uh, I don't know, you know, a, a low voltage supply that you wanted to transform up at the same time from a battery, you've at least got a constant DC source from which to work. And I would think then you might be able to configure the output stage to simultaneously boost the, the supply and drive the load. Um, that's totally off the top of my head. It might be bunkum in, in reality, but I, would, I wouldn't dismiss it if somebody came to me with it as an idea. Um, having said all of that, I think I would come back to what I call, you know, rather conceitedly called Turner's Law earlier on, that there's always a certain amount of volt ampere product required. And what you'd probably find, I'll be bound, I will be very surprised if it's not the case, is that if you cleverly integrate the amplifier and the power supply topology, the power switching capabilities that you'll need will be will be more expensive. You know, you'll need more volt amps, you'll need more volts in the switches than than you would. Um, and if you add up the total volt ampere product that you would need compared with a more conventional structure, you'll probably find it isn't any better. In fact, it's probably worse. So um, I, I I will. Absolutely um, defer to your experience, Gary, because, you know, I've, I've done some class D work, as, as you can probably see. It's not what I've spent a lifetime doing. And if you've designed lots of small amps for IoT, I'd be very interested to learn more um, about your experiences. But uh, that's my 10 penneth for what it's worth. Interesting. Um, also, if people want to have a look at, I mean, I think there's also an issue of picking up um noise and other rubbish from the power supply absolutely yes absolutely which yes. is is a definite issue i think um if you really want to see efficiency pushed to some bizarre extent unfortunately not always directly applicable to audio um take a look at mobile telephone base station mm. transmitters oh yeah yeah because you know when you when you're a company running you know, a network of those things, <laughs> efficiency saves you recurrent running cost. Um, those uh, things tend to work on a sort of class G type structure, don't they, where well, you actually modulate the supply rails. In, there, in There's even more weird stuff out there. I can not. amplifiers and things. Um, but uh, we've got a question in the um, chat so that I'd like to know. Somebody asked... Hello, why are sine wave test signals problematic for switch mode power supply audio amps? Hmm. Um, um, I know they were myself, but uh, <laughs> answer that. Yes, you've 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 stolen my immediate answer, Jamie. For um, you're welcome. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say, either, are they? Um, I mean, I suppose. I mean, no. I I, I get the point. Um, I think the answer to that, uh, Keith, is um, simply because. It's uh, a, an, an unrealistically, real, in, in real world terms, it's an unrealistically stressful condition. Um, the simple answer is that the amplifier designer uh, in question hasn't designed the power supply for the full sine wave throughput of the amplifier. You know, if, you, if you take a, a large PA amplifier, like the one I showed in the picture earlier, it's got eight kilowatts of capability. And I do know those guys do put sine waves through them and test them. Um, they've got a big bank of load resistors in their workshop and they, they put them on soap test at full power and, 
oil the electricity meter frequently um, to uh, to deal with the losses. Um, so it is possible to design them that way. I don't think there's anything inherent about it. It would, I, I think it's probably true that um, that the supplies are designed. Yeah, you're referring to high power PA amplifiers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think it's simply that the the it, it represents by far the most stressful condition. Simple as that. Um, music signals and and this is back to Jamie's papers, which I, I commend you to read, um, where the statistical properties of music are and speech are such that you you spend most of your time doing not very much, and so the power supply doesn't really end up doing a great deal of work. Whereas you put sine wave through it, of course, you're you're providing the full, you know, n kilowatts continuously, which never ever happens in the real world with speech or music. Um, yes, if you're running a vibration shaker table or something to you know, test a, uh, a a piece of equipment mechanically to destruction, you need that kind of amplifier with that kind of power supply. But I don't see any reason why, um, in theory, it should be any more stressful than any other type of equipment using a switch mode supply. Um, I would say, though, I think I remember John Dawson, you can correct me if I've got this wrong, is that some of the standards for power amplifiers going into the home ah. safety standards actually do require that you run them at a, a certain power level with a sine wave and prove that they won't catch fire. Um, yes, you're right. And um, there's a content, there's eighth power ratings and third power ratings. I don't have it all in front of me at the moment, but you definitely have to look after some of those things um, and they will be tested by the safety people. And therein lies, if you like, a conflict, because even if we know the audio signals don't match those statistics, we still have to match the safety standards. One mm -hmm. of the banes of being a, a manufacturer of real gear, as opposed to an academic like me. Uh, ha -ha. Sorry. Yes, I'm laughing. Um, you can't see me. So <laughs> sorry about that. But um, yes, real world impinges on academia. Rats. <laughs> <laughs> it's so unfair yeah. e emc is a topic as well that sort of touches on all of that stuff um you know talking of regulatory testing um and and uh, and so does safety you know if you've got switch mode power supplies with multiple isolation barriers and, mo and therefore multiple opportunities for live to meet earthy um that's another area that probably is a bit more difficult to deal with than than is the case with with a you know conventional class a b amplifier where um you know you can buy a very nice transformer that deals with all of that and comes pre-approved to all the different ul standards and and ce marks and so on um whereas um in a switch mode supply you're going to have to deal with probably quite a lot of isolation barriers in your design um whether it's you know bolting live transistors down to earthy heat sinks or um, PCB traces near one another that that have hundreds of volts across them, um, that side of things you know that probably contributes again to this sort of people shuddering and saying black art because they get you know uh, metaphorically and literally burned by those. Okay, more questions. Ah, yeah, Keith's, Keith's just commenting in the chat that uh, DSP-based amps, um, you know, can limit the output uh, when they're testing a, a sine wave, um, which is, <laughs> I was thinking, is, is that a little bit like the Volkswagen yeah. um, uh, exhaust particulates check or whatever it was, where the, the software is smart enough to know what's being done and says, aha. <laughs> it's happened but, before, I mean... I've, I've seen a piece of DSP equipment um, change its time constants to um, on the basis of the signal statistics and unintentionally, therefore, change its performance to match the test signal and then change it back to it's not such good performance on uh, real signals. Ah. Yep. It, uh, so... Um, it's it can be a bit of a minefield. I think that would be eminently possible. So good point, Keith. More questions, people. <laughs> 
um, I'm going to um, do a going, going, gone thing. Um, do we have any more questions? <laughs> Excuse me. For the first time of asking, for the second time of asking, for the third time of asking. Um, no, thank you, everybody. Yes, for thank, you. thank you very much to yes. uh, Jamie for hosting and Mike uh, for My presenting. Pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Mike. indeed. Thank you, Jeff. Um, agreed. Thank you, Mike, for uh, an interesting uh, presentation. And um, by the way, I noticed one of those Trembler devices had synchronous rectification built in as well. So take care, everyone. Um, I hope you have uh, an enjoyable rest of your new year. Um, and we'll see you at other sessions. All be well. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.